Hi, welcome to Cape Chronicle. I'm Jacob McClellan. On today's show, we have one guest, Diane Ream, host of the public radio program, The Diane Ream Show. A conversation with Diane Ream that's coming up on Cape Chronicle. Stay tuned. Smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. <laughs> Take time to be a dad today. He fought against cruelty and injustice, but his greatest fight was against mental illness. Even icons struggle. Only the great ones keep going. Chronicle. I'm Jacob McClellan. Our guest today is Diane Ream. Every day, 2.6 million people turn into her program on more than 250 public radio stations, including KRCU here in Cape Girardeau. Her guests have ranged from presidents to authors to scientists to leading experts in their field. She's hosted her own show, which was originally called Kaleidoscope and later changed the Diane Ream show since 1979. Diane Ream, thank you so much for taking the time to talk My with us today. My delight. Thank you. And before we begin, I want to point out that we do have a live studio audience today on our program. Good, we have good. we have students from the uh, from the mass media department here at Southeast Missouri State University and the communication disorders um, uh, uh, program here good, at Southeast. Good. Now, first, I want to talk with you a little bit about your about your beginnings in in broadcast media because. This wasn't something you jumped into immediately. Um, in fact, you, I would think, were, were 37 years old when you got your first I was 37 job. years old, and I walked in as a volunteer. I had been a homemaker for 14 years, raising two wonderful children, and then began to realize that I needed to think about the rest of my life. Um, I think women of that era uh, were mostly homemakers. I had never been to college, so I really didn't know what I wanted to do. Of course, I had listened to radio from the time I was a little girl all the way through, and by total chance a friend of mine mentioned to me that she had been volunteering for this tiny little radio station at American University, WAMU, which then had fewer than five full-time people. And as you know, five full-time people is the threshold at which a station can become part of NPR. So it wasn't even at the time part of NPR. But I walked in, I introduced myself to the host of what was then called The Home Show. We had a lovely conversation. She said, come back next week and you can help us put the program together. So I came back the following week and with fear and trembling because, you know, I had not been in the workplace for a long time, but I was welcomed at the door by the manager at the station, and she said, oh, you must be the new volunteer. Well, she said, I have some bad news, and my heart sank. I thought she was going to tell me to go back home and never show my face again. Instead, she said to me, the host is out sick. Well, I didn't know what that was going to mean, but she followed that by saying, so I would like you to come into the studio with me as I, she, host the program. So the very first day as a volunteer, I was on the air helping her with a discussion with someone from the Dairy Council. And of course, as a mother, 
I had thought about what the best foods were for my children. I felt that the Department of Agriculture had the pyramid all wrong. So I expressed my opinions, I asked questions, I, you know, just did what I normally do, and I think I've been on the air every day since then. You just did what you normally, what you normally did anyway, but this time you had people listening to you. Exactly, yeah. but you yeah. know, at the time when uh, WAMU was so small, the listenership was so small because the tower was a small one, but as time went on, and of course it expanded, WAMU now has about 130 full-time employees, so it's grown a great deal. I, I want to go back a little bit. To, you mentioned that you um, you were a homemaker before you before you started in radio. Um, in in your book, Finding My Voice, you mentioned one of the questions uh, in, in Washington that you that you hated to hear was what do you do? That there was this, this stigma um, for women that, that, that stayed at home to raise their children. Uh, how do you, do you, do you feel that that's changed any for, for women today, that, uh, that, that question and, and that stigma? I still hear women complain that when they are at cocktail parties or they are at dinner parties, that if they say, I'm a homemaker, I stay home, I care for my children, that people tend to ignore them. Um, I make a point of saying, number one, congratulations, I'm glad you're doing that. For me, that time at home was so incredibly useful. I learned to cook, I learned to sew, I learned to play the piano. Um, I think I had a life of privilege back then because the economy was so different on a very small salary that my husband made uh, working at the Department of State. We were able to buy our first home. He was able to support me and the children now it's so different. I think the pressures on young couples are so very different because it's almost assumed that women will be wage earners as well. But I heard the other day that it's trending the other way again, that more and more women are staying at home. now. Or, or, a men, or men as well. Or men as well. Now, there is a problem for women in professions like the law, for example, because promotions tend to take place in terms of how long someone's been with the law firm. But I think the workplace has begun to adjust and has begun to acknowledge reality, namely that women have children, they take off time to have babies, that should not impede their progress in the workplace. One of our own producers on the Diane Rain Show is due to have a child in August, She's already determined that she'll be off from August until January when she wants to come back. Um, and we are making arrangements so that that can be possible. And I think more and more the workplace is making accommodations. Now, you mentioned earlier that you started on a, a local show um, and then on a very, very small radio station. Right. Fast forward, you know, 40 years, and yeah. now 250 public radio stations, um, 2.6 million people listen to your show every day. You've interviewed presidents, scientists. You've interviewed uh, so many different people. I'm not going to ask you the dreaded um, who's your favorite yeah. interview question. Thank you. I am going to ask, though, Okay. Because this is a problem we have at KRCU during our fun drives because we have this fertile ecosystem of inside jokes that crack us up. 
have you, has there ever been somebody that was either so funny or said something so outlandish that you could barely maintain your composure on air? Here's what happened, and I won't mention <laughs> any names. After the Nixon tapes came out, I had a panel of former uh, Nixon scholars, um, not former, but Nixon scholars and uh, people who were close to Richard Nixon. Um, indeed, one was counsel to Richard Nixon. And at one point in the conversation, one of the gentlemen stood up while we were on the air and said, Diane, if you don't let me speak more, I am never coming back here again. And I said, without blinking an eye, don't worry, you won't be invited. <laughs> I mean, what can you do with outrageous right. behavior like that? I think you just have to face it head on. I haven't had many experiences like that. You know, people ask me how I deal with unruly callers or callers who may go on and on. <clears throat> what they're not quite aware of is that I have, and I don't know whether it exists here at your station, I have something called a fader button. Mm -hmm. So we operate, number one, with a seven-second delay, and that's for FCC rules, that's for making sure that inappropriate words, ideas don't get on the air. But if a person is going on and on and on and on, and you feel you've heard the appropriate question once, I wait for that half an instant when that person pauses to take a breath and I put the fader <laughs> button down. So you as a listener do not think he's being cut off I'm just stopping him. He's gone on long enough, or she's gone on long enough. So that's how we sort of make sure mm -hmm. that the program does not get out of hand. Is that, is that when you'll say, thank you very much for your call? Absolutely. And move on. Absolutely. And move on. Let's, um, let, let, I mean, your, your preparation for, the, for your show is, is, is second to none. You, you bring in, you, every day you just seem so well prepared um, for, for each one of these topics, and the topics can range um, so much every day. Uh, tell us a little bit about your preparation method, and is it different to prepare, for instance, for a, um, for a congressman, for instance, as compared to an actor or, a, or, an, or an author? Um, the authors, I want to say up front, uh, the writers probably interest me more than anyone, the reason being that they allow themselves to dream on the air. Um, they're not wedded to any particular line or any particular idea that they're trying to get across. They allow me to probe in ways that, uh, you know, uh, members of Congress especially now, tend to have a line that they do not cross. You can ask a question in 20 different ways, you'll get the same answer. Um, my preparation is totally dependent on a number of things. First, reading three newspapers each morning. And by reading, I don't mean to mislead you. I go through newspapers very quickly. New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal. I go through those at home while I'm having breakfast. 
then I get to the office. A script has been prepared for me by one of my superb producers. There are five full-time, two part-time. One person has taken responsibility for each hour. So that producer will put the script on my desk. The script contains the billboard, which you hear at the top of the hour. It contains the introduction with all of the individuals who are going to be on the program, some of whom will be in the studio some of whom will be on ISDN, and some of whom will be on Skype. I was the first um, in the network to begin using Skype, and now there are a number of others who do it. It works very well on radio. I happen to like seeing people's body language. I like to look in their eyes. I like to know when they want to say something, and you can judge that better if somebody is on Skype. In the studio, you know when somebody wants it. If that person is just on the telephone, I have to listen very carefully for an intake of breath, which tells me that that person on the phone wants to say something. Whereas if they're on Skype, I can see they're raising their hand. They want to get in there. They're chomping at the bit. Absolutely. Um, going back to preparation, the producer has given me questions and answers which completely outline the topic. So I have started reading that at about 8.45 in the morning. Now, that is in preparation for the 10 o'clock hour. So I'm reading from about 8.45 until 9.15. I'm a quick study. I can take it in. And of course, I've read the newspapers. I'm listening to Morning Edition. I know what's happening in the world. Uh, every now and then, after the first repeat of Morning Edition, I tune in to Morning Joe so that um, I get some different perspectives mm -hmm. on what's happening. And usually the topic that we're going to discuss that morning is being discussed all around. So um, all of that preparation may be for naught <laughs> when you go into the studio because what you have to learn to do, and I think we as talk show hosts really are misnamed. We ought to be called listening show hosts because it's through listening to what the guest has to say and following that conversation that really is the essence of what makes a good program. And I tell people who aspire to do the kind of work that what I do and what you must do as a talk show host, is first learn to listen. So that's pretty much my preparation. And then as soon as I get off the air, I am reading for the next day's second hour, which has already been done uh, by the uh, one of the producers. But you see, we choose our first hour topics only 24 hours ahead. Mm -hmm. So people are scrambling. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mentioned earlier we, we, have, we have a few uh, classes watching us today as we're, as, as, as we're talking. Good. Um, what are some of the things that are for, for young folks that are interested in, in getting into broadcast media or to, or in, to media in any way? What are some suggestions that you have 
that you have for them before they before they before they launch into a career like that? What I tell uh, young people who are even considering going into broadcasting is first to get the best liberal arts education possible, and then from there to choose a special area that they're really excited about because broadcasters are, I mean, the big networks, CBS, NBC, and, uh, and ABC, and Fox, tend to hire people with special knowledge about something. I mean, I realize that many of the networks are looking for handsome or pretty faces, but at the same time, you have to come in with some real understanding, be it the weather, be it medicine, be it science, be it politics. So that's why I think getting that very broad education first and then narrowing your perspective and then taking that knowledge to a broadcaster is probably a better way. There are an awful lot of graduates of journalism schools, including this very fine uh, graduate school of journalism here. The field is crowded. The field is so crowded that people with broadcast journalism degrees are having to look elsewhere. So I do believe that finding that specialty, being behind the camera, for example, uh, learning to do the engineering part of it, those can all be good entrees into broadcasting. I want to go back a little bit to something you said um, at the beginning of our, when we started talking today. You mentioned um, when you when you were when you were home with your with your kids before you started your radio career. That gave you an opportunity to to learn how to play piano and uh, learn how to sew. Now, sewing, as I understand, is something that 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 was very important to you. Very. Tell us a, tell us a little bit uh, about that. Well, I think it goes back to my mother. I watched my mother sew. My mother was such an incredible seamstress, seamstress that one day I recall my sister, who was five years older than I, had been inducted into the high school cheerleading squad. My sister came home and said she needed a skirt for the cheerleading squad, and we couldn't afford to buy her the fairly expensive skirt. So my mother said to Georgette, my sister, bring one of the skirts home. And she did. And my mother looked at that pleated skirt, created a pattern and made my sister the skirt. She had that extraordinary talent. Now, my talent did not go anywhere near that far, but there is both an art and a science to sewing. And my husband once joked that he watched me put in and take out a sleeve five times until I finally got it <laughs> right. And I think that persistence carries through in what you and I do. In other words, you're aiming for a certain standard. It may not be perfect, but you're aiming for that standard and you keep trying until you get it 
to your own satisfaction. So I think sewing taught me a great deal. Is, is sewing also, is it a certain connection that you still have with, with your mother? It is. I think um, even when I'm hemming a dress or making a repair, sewing a button, mm -hmm. I think of her um, making a beautiful coat for me when I was nine years old. Uh, there is a photograph of me in that coat somewhere, and I'll always remember it. Let's, I want to talk a little bit about, um, about spasmatic dysphonia. Um, that's the, the condition that you have that affects your voice. Um, tell us, I mean, just a, a, give us some background on, on what that is and how you, how you learned that, that, that you have that condition. In, uh, I think, 1992, I started having symptoms of a tremor in my voice, and I had been taking a lot of Advil for headaches, to sleep at night. I had the, um, I think I was getting more and more anxious. And so I started going to otolaryngologists, and one after another kept putting tubes down my throat. And they all came away saying, there's nothing wrong with your voice. It's all in your head. That went on for six years until... Did, did you ever tell them, I used to host a show about the connection between the mind and the body? <laughs> of course. Of course. Huh. And it was just, and it, they all just kind of... <clears throat> in your head. They all said the same thing. And... Finally, in 1998, my voice was so bad, I could barely get a word out. So I told my boss I had to get off the air for a while because I had to find out what was wrong with my voice. I was off the air for four months, and finally, my internist called my husband and said, we have to get Diane to Johns Hopkins. We have to find out if there is a cancer of the throat, that somebody is missing, that there is ALS or Parkinson's or something else. Within one hour, they diagnosed spasmodic dysphoria. Uh, spasmodic dysphonia. It begins in the basal ganglia of the brain, sending an incorrect message to the vocal cords, telling them to clamp down inappropriately. And then <coughs> you cannot get those words out. There is no known cause. There is no known cure. The only temporary solution is an injection of Botox into the vocal cords, which I have every six months or so. We've been talking today with Diane Ream, the host of the public radio program, The Diane Ream Show. Diane, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure talking with you today. Great to talk with you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today for Cape Chronicle. The program is a collaboration between the Department of Mass Media at Southeast Missouri State University, the City of Cape Girardeau, and KRCU, the public radio station for Southeast Missouri. I'm Jacob McClellan. Thanks for watching.